In the beginning, a little more than four billion years ago, the Earth was a ball of fire being bombarded by the solar system. The atmosphere on Earth was made up of heavy gases like methane or ammonia and was unbreathable. Life was impossible. But millions of years of collisions, eruptions and combustion meant that the gases trapped inside the planet were released. Nitrogen, water vapour and carbon dioxide were freed. It's from the raging volcanoes that the climate appeared. because the spread of these molecules is where everything began. The high quantity of water vapour present in the atmosphere leads to a deluge that favours the spread of oxygen through the air and offers us a birthplace the oceans. Here we were born, in the middle of nowhere and by complete chance on this blue planet, 71% covered by water. And if it took billions of years and the ideal conditions for our existence, it may only take global warming for us to disappear. The skies, mankind and the sea are linked in a fragile balance. The ocean can be considered to be the Earth's main lung, even regulating its climate. To better understand its role, we're taking you to the four corners of the Earth. In the Atlantic, Tara and her team of scientists who are looking in the water for the origins of the climate. Off the coast of Peru with the giant squid fishers, because under their feet the sea gets its breath back. On the banks of the Arctic Ocean, where some meteorologists are the weather's watchmen. Right now, our journey begins between the Celeb Sea, the island of Sulawesi, and the Makassar Strait, a wonderful triangle of biodiversity where the last nomads of the sea, the Badiauslaut, still live to the rhythm of the ocean. If their future is linked to the ocean, their past was shaped by the climate. According to legend, a flood submerged their homeland and forced them to take refuge on their boats. They drifted for seven days and nights until they reached this paradise-like corner of the world. Since then, they live in harmony on the horizon, paying close attention to the slightest variations in the skies. As they do each day, the leader of the Baisaran clan and his son, Kol Nirdati, prepare to scour the ocean for their daily fish, as they've always done since time immemorial, at the mercy of the lapping water, the beginnings of the world. For us, humanity was created by the spirits of our ancestors. They created four populations with distinct characteristics. These populations were placed onto the four corners of the earth and formed four nations, four. The spirits asked each people to make a choice. The Bajaus were asked to choose between knowing to ride or mastering the ocean. Our ancestors chose the ocean. They didn't want to learn to write. That's why, since time began, generations of Bajaus continued to live off the sea. Our concern is fishing, fishing with nets or lines. It's our destiny. We're used to this life. Our universe is here. If we are on land for too long, our bodies start to burn. The Badyals are intimately linked to the climate and the movements of the sky. They know the cooling and regulating benefits of the ocean, but their legacy has its codes and apprehensions. If we provoke the sea when the spirits have told us that's not good, we act badly and things immediately happen to us. We get hurt or fall ill. We're not rich anymore than we're poor, but we have to get our sustenance and that 
comes through respect. That's the way it is. The Badyals respect the sea in order for it to feed them. They only take what they need to survive. They depend on its grace and the whims of the skies as well. The rain starts to fall. The wind picks up. Kolnadati gives the order to anchor the boats to the reef and to be patient. You risk your life when the sky lashes out. If the storm passes, that's great. But the worst is when you're caught up in it. If the boat takes it in water, for example, there are those who know how to swim and get out and those who die. There's a lot of stories of boats sinking. Many have lost their lives like that, believe me. They get caught unaware in strong winds and that's it. Nowadays, the risk is even higher. The south wind is much stronger. And if the winds are a little stronger than today, we can't control anything. There's nothing we can do apart from wait and sit it out. Our ancestors could chase the rain away just by blowing on the clouds. But we don't know how to do that. They had magic spells. If we knew them, we'd already have used them. But we've forgotten them. All civilizations have a history that is punctuated with floods, rains or storms. The history of man has been liked to the climate since the dawn of time. The wind has eased and Baisaran and Kolnodati decide to raise the anchor and go in search of fish where the weather is milder. At the same moment in Russia, on the edge of the Arctic Ocean, the sun is rising on the little weather station in Kodovarika. Because legends couldn't explain everything, science and with it meteorology were born. To try to understand the phenomenons of the climate, man felt the need to set up in the most remote corners of the planet. The Russian Arctic is one of these strategic areas. One page of the history of the climate is played out in this polar region. Ice and rust, a few shacks that look abandoned. The first village days away by snowmobile. Climate research won't settle for just the shining satellites. Here, Slava Korotk is one of the last people to live like a scientific polar expedition of the ex-Soviet Union. He's a Polonik, a cosmonaut of meteorology, explorer of the cold. At the very north of the world and forgotten, Slava lives at the pace of his weather readings just where the weather and passing time meet. This tape tells us how many hours of sunshine there has been here. All that is noted, recorded and sent. Every three hours, Slava measures the temperature, atmospheric pressure, rainfall. Once a week, he goes to measure the thickness of the ice field. Under his feet, only a few centimetres of ice separate him from the Arctic Ocean. We do this mainly to study the ice field. 
because the accumulation of the ice depends on the layer of snow, height of the snow and its density as well. Here the thickness of the ice is 70 to 90 centimeters. Monitoring the thickness of the ice field is crucial because its white mantle reflects the sun's rays and protects the Arctic Ocean from warming. This region is a real cold pole and is vital for the climate to function. His readings in hand, Slava goes to send the health report of the ice at the skies. He does this at 8.30 a.m. every day. His only contact with the outside world is through a radio transmitter. Are you receiving? It's for the weather report. The weather, yes, yes. 23103, 23103, 4199797, 4199797, 110, 46, 3rd section, 210-87, 210-87. Even in the age of satellites, weather stations on the ground remain indispensable. Slava's readings may hang on a thread, but they are reliable. His data will be used by forecasters over the entire world to model the climate and understand the changes year by year. In meteorology, everything is connected. The difference in temperatures and pressure between the poles and the equator create winds and currents, and the currents themselves, both on the surface and in the depths, play an important role regulating the climate. In Paita, in Peru, thanks to the currents from the depths that bring nutrients to the surface, the climate is the origin of life. And it's thanks to the Humboldt current in particular that Peru is the second largest fish producer in the world. In Paita, they mainly fish for porta, the giant squid. It will end up being exported as animal flour, frozen fritters or surimi mix, which is good news for the Paita fishermen. Here, everybody dreams of having a boat built or tries to go to sea. They dream of fish, always bigger than the last and of miraculous fishing. Victor Silva, the boat's captain, is about to leave. Just time to check that his team is ready to lift the anchor and his boat, the Empress Blanca Eugenia, is ready to set out to take on the Pacific Ocean. Hi guys, how's it going? Victor and his men get back to the sea. There's no lifeboat to leave room for the squid and hearts filled with hope to forget that the fact they can't swim. Like everywhere in the world, the sea has its dangers. Once we went to fish for dolphin fish. We hadn't been gone for long when the boat started to take on water. We hadn't caught many fish and the wind was blowing quite strongly, a bit like now, and the material got tangled. The water flooded the store and started to melt the ice. We didn't have enough left for the two remaining days of fishing. Also, the stand for the motor had broken. We were working below. The lines were in the water. We had a big problem. It's easy to do whatever I want and throw myself into the water to go looking for squid. But if God says there are no squid, then I can only keep looking for them until God says, now you can, and then I'll catch them. Men look for fish in the seas, appealing to the heavens. Providence is as old as fishing. In reality, it's the Humboldt current which decides if there will be fish in the region or not. 
because the Humboldt, like all the maritime currents, carries with it billions of tiny living organisms, larvae, mini algae, bacteria, a whole collection that we call plankton and which nourishes the fish. As incredible as it sounds, these little organisms at the bottom of the marine food chain also play a considerable role in regulating the climate. To understand their exact function in the climate, the expedition boat Tara has been travelling the oceans for over 10 years. And it currently has its sails set towards the southeast coast of Greenland. Tara. One captain, a dozen crew members, all in the service of science and life. From the samples of the planet's waters, perseverance and conviction, sailors and scientists have come together to put into perspective the essential role that the oceans play in regulating the climate. On board, Gabby Gorski, plankton specialist, is about to drop his manta net to take the first sample of the day. We take the GPS positions of the start and everything else to have all the necessary data to estimate the volume and the surface. So we let it all the way out, that's 80 metres, so it's behind the boat's wake. The manta net is lowered into the water. With its gaping mouth, it combs the top 20 centimetres of the surface. Microplankton, microalgae, everything that it goes through will be collected, then sampled. A half hour wait for the Holy Grail. With a sun that never sets in this period of the year and thanks to a high level of nutrients, the Arctic waters are rich. We don't have to wait long until Gabby's net finds a bloom of plankton. A spontaneous explosion of life. This phenomenon is so big that it can be seen from space. After half an hour, the net is lifted. Gabby will be able to classify and sample the plankton and so clarify its role in regulating the climate. This time, the collection seems to have been a great success. It's incredible, incredible, to do a daytime collection of surface plankton and to have this many. It's amazing. Usually we get just a little. Here there's five litres, and around a third is filled by little copods. We'll take a look with the microscope to see exactly what it is. A little gelatinous, but a huge quantity for the surface in the daytime. I've come to the conclusion that life is a miracle. When we look at physics, chemistry, biology, genomics, how has life progressed? How was life created? We need to be conscious that we're part of an ecosystem, part of the Earth, part of a planet. Each organism is an ecosystem. We are an ecosystem. Plankton. Whether it's animal-based like copepods or plant-based like phytoplankton, makes up over 90% of the living mass of the oceans. Phytoplankton is plant-based plankton. Like the primal forests, these mini-algae allow the planet to breathe by absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to free oxygen. It's these little organisms who, billions of years ago, helped with the creation of the atmosphere. It's them who started up the climate machine. Without them, nothing would be possible. They're also the first links in the marine food chain, and our health depends on theirs, since man is at the top of the chain.
in the Celeb Sea, Baisaran and Kolnidati are a good example. They've been looking for a lagoon to fish in for several days. They move to the rhythm of the plankton. Trying to avoid the caprices of the skies, their makeshift boat, their only shelter. We're nomads. We live to the ocean's rhythm. Our next destination depends on the fish who depend on the current. If the current goes that way, we'll follow it. And if it's raining when we get there, well, it's raining. We don't have a choice. That's the way it is. It's better if it's not raining, of course. On arrival, the sun is shining. And to be sure that the currents are leading by Saran and his crew to a school of fish, Siblin throws himself into the water, one of the best hunter-divers in the region. He breathes in one last time before this breathtaking adventure. Siblin seems to be one of the last people to remember that the ocean allows us to breathe. He can stay underwater for several minutes looking for fish and 15 meters deep, defying the limits of the human body. His body is so dense that he can stay in an upright position as if he was hunting on land. His heart rate drops to 30 beats a minute. His survival instinct tells him when it's time to come up. When people on land see me, they ask, do you use weights to go down to the bottom? I tell them I don't. But then how is it possible, they ask? How can you walk underwater? In fact, it's a special gift. A shaman told me so, and now I can stay for several minutes underwater. Underwater hunting is made for me. I feel good when I'm underwater, and the reason I feel so good is that once I've dived and I'm at the bottom, I don't think about anything. It clears my head. The sea is made up of water. Water which, for all land animals, is something unbreathable and that asphyxiates. Except for Siblin, who has almost become half fish, in symbiosis with the water. In reality, he's right. The sea is the link between the surface and the depths. Notably, thanks to the currents, it absorbs carbon dioxide to release oxygen. It's the sea on the surface that gives us oxygen to breathe, as well as fish to eat. The Bajaus can eat now, one hand on their food but one eye on the sea, another on the sky, because it's the season of spring tides and Baisaran is wary. We don't know if the tide is good or bad. We don't know much about it. What we do know is that if we let ourselves drift, it can take us with it. The tide is the sea breathing. It comes, it goes. Nowadays, the currents and the winds are stronger and stronger, and we don't know why. It's complicated for us. The Badyaws are like the watchmen of the climate. If the winds and the currents are stronger, this is a sign of climate change, because the ocean and the climate are inseparable. Because the skies and the sea have been linked since the dawn of time.
When it turns on itself, the Earth produces winds which, in contact with the ocean, create marine currents that can move millions of cubic metres of water. This is how warm water from the tropics moves towards the poles. The polar regions cool the warm water on the surface, which becomes more dense and so sinks to the bottom of the ocean, taking with it carbon dioxide from the air. This is how the currents play the role of a heat pump that regulates the Earth's climate. Without realising, Baisaran and Slava are connected in the same way as the Celeb Sea and the North Pole. It's a few days away from spring on the little weather station in Kodovarika, and Slava is taking his third reading of the day. Quantity, six to seven points. Wind direction, south, southwest. Temperature, minus 1.4 degrees. Maximal, minus 1.2 degrees. And after shaking, minus 1.4 degrees. Spring is arriving sooner and autumn later. You know, with global warming, the Netherlands may be flooded. Russia as well, though not entirely. But when that happens, I'll be long retired. I'll grow vegetables by my dacha. And at the end of my garden, I'll have a little boat that I'll take out fishing. Anyway, I'm not afraid of global warming. Look at this landscape. You can't imagine how nice it is to be in the tundra. When you travel 30, 40, 50 kilometers, and there's no sign of any people. Wherever you look is immaculate white. The horizon melts away. And at the end of the sky is an abyss. It's endless. On the other side of the world, off the coast of Peru, Victor and his men are on the bridge. There's something different in the air and the water that tells them that the porta, the giant squid, are nearby. The optimism is almost palpable. It's been a while since we found as many potters in this season. We didn't think there would be so many. They're usually further north, but they've been going further south for a while. This migration is a new symptom of climate change. As the planet gets warmer, the plankton migrate to colder waters, and with the plankton, the whole food chain moves towards the poles. Victor and his men are the outposts of a world that is changing. Their exclusive fishing zones and the laws that protected them yesterday will soon be null and void. The climate is rewriting fishing maps worldwide. Industrial fishing wants to take our place, a place that we artisans have struggled to earn. Chinese, Koreans, Japanese, they all want to fish here. They have the power. They've practically wiped out the sardine and the anchovy, and now they want to do the same to the potter. Thank you. 
There are two possibilities. Either we fishermen sit up and take notice of this, and there'll be some left in the future. For that, we need to adopt quotas, be more disciplined, practice sustainable fishing. Or we do nothing, and in 15 years, there'll be no more pota. While waiting for a favourable outcome on the issue of industrial fishing, Victor's men still managed to get their first porter out of the water. And soon, the frequency of the catches confirms that a shoal of porter is naively dancing under the hull of the bridge. Long, retractable tentacles, which have powerful suckers to immobilise large prey, changing pigments that seem to reflect their mood and a mouth that's powerful enough to crush its victims in one go. This is Dosidicus Gigas, the devil of the depths in person, as the fishermen like to call it, the Humboldt squid. Careful, the wetter you are, the more likely you are to slip. It gives us enough money to survive and to keep our families. I throw the intestines back into the water. The other pota will eat them. He's a big one. How much do you think it weighs? Eight kilos? You're joking. I reckon at least 20 kilos. We've caught some that weighed up to 90 kilos. Porter can attack you and drag you under. In one night, Victor and his men have managed to catch 12 tons of porter and fill the hold. Empress Blanca Eugenia can proudly return to port with her stomach full. Off the coast of Greenland, the Tara expedition boat has just dropped anchor. Olivier Gug, his wife Brigitte and their son Vladimir have spotted an island from which they should be able to take samples and readings. It's been over 10 years that this family of ornithologists have travelled in the Arctic. And with this Tara mission, they'll be able to update a precious inventory of the birds of South Greenland. The birds of the region are considered to be real indicators of the climate. For this visit, it's the Arctic tern who welcomes them. This bird is especially astonishing. The climate and the seasons entirely condition its life. Every year, it travels 70,000 kilometres from one pole to the other to find the best temperature for its development until it lands here and tries to reproduce before leaving. That nest has two eggs, which is fine. There must be chicks there. Are you looking for the chicks, Vlad? Hundred and ten, hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty, hundred and forty, hundred and fifty, a hundred and sixty, a hundred and seventy, a hundred and eighty. That makes five, six, two hundred and fifty five nests. That's astounding. There's not even two thousand square meters of suitable habitat there. With two, three eggs per nest, that's more than five hundred babies that can hatch on a small area like that. Counting nests, birds, feathers. This type of science may seem ridiculous, but in reality it's very effective. For 5,000 years, men have observed birds and their migrations. This knowledge passed down over generations of bird watchers relates the changing climate. And on this subject, the Arctic tern is a true example of resilience and hope.
As soon as we hear those calls, that's an Arctic ambience for us. Even when you see them migrating in South Europe, it's a species that is pretty emblematic of the Arctic, and its migration is amazing. It goes to the Antarctic in winter, then comes back here to nest every year. It really embodies the Arctic, and this interface between the land and the sea, with predators coming to feed like foxes, and even itself feeding on little crustaceans, little animals, plankton. Oh, hell, there's a chick there, dead. What kind of chick? An Ida. Okay. Oh, he's big too. He was born a while ago. For a scientist, death and life are connected like predators and prey. It's all a matter of balance. Ida live a very long time, so it's not going to stop them coming back next year. There aren't many islands that are suitable for nesting, so they'll come back for a year, two years, three years, ten years. It's not just the temperature and the thermometers that are going to affect a species. It's the ida along with the seagull, the bear, the ice field and the rain as well. We saw in the north that there didn't used to be rain in the summer in North Greenland. Nowadays, there's rain and some species who nest there are not at all adapted to it. The chicks down only lets them survive one or two days in the rain, so entire colonies are wiped out very quickly. I maybe shouldn't say this, but it's true that nature will adapt in one way or another. Some species will disappear. OK, but the reason we talk so much about climate change at the moment is because it's man who will be most affected. Birds, well, some species will disappear. Others will go further north, so new communities with new interactions will form, but it won't be the end of the world. The end of the world may not happen today, but by 2050, scientists predict that one in six birds will disappear, one in five reptiles and one in four mammals. With the equivalent of 15 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide released into the air each year, the ocean does what it can, but the pump is reaching saturation. The Badiauslaut nomads may not understand the workings of science, but they've inherited a knowledge that Mother Nature has passed down to them. The Badiaus teach us to listen to and respect the elements. Fire, earth, wind and water give us heat, cold and humidity. The climate's components are inseparable and in harmony when they're in equilibrium. As soon as the sky and the tides let them, Colonel Dati and his brothers equip themselves with a mask and a bucket. They search the depths for shellfish and giant clams. The lives of the Bajaos depend entirely on these coral reefs that they know like the back of their hands. They know that the corals are alive. The coral is really just a spongy mass from the jellyfish family. It's plankton, a plankton that doesn't drift with the currents, but which is fixed to the ground. With their roots and branches, these coral form real tropical underwater forests. And like forests, they shelter life and pump carbon from the air. They play a vital role in regulating the climate. Yet these corals, which are so important for the climate, are disappearing. Most of the fishing in the region is done with cyanide and dynamite. Some of the fishermen come from here, others from further away. The resources are running out, and we're not allowed to fish on the reef over there, or that one as their protected marine zones. Soon we won't even be able to come here. We're also chased by pirates from the Philippines. Men have gone mad. What will we become? So we've come to take refuge here. But this morning they go ashore to collect wood and repair the roof of the boat a paradise-like island which has well-kept secrets. For Baisaran, stepping foot on land means taking a risk for his whole family and putting them in danger. 
so his only desire is to get the stop off over with and get back out to the skies and the sea. Take that over there. Go back and rest. Now? Yes. Gather up these bits of wood and take the pile back to the boat. Put them down, have a nap. I'll be right there. We never sleep on the ground. Everything on the ground bites us and itches, especially when the night falls. We're very scared of the forest. There are things there that can strangle you. If we're not back on the boat, we're not at ease. The forest demon can come out at any moment and suffocate us if we stay there. The sea spirits are good. They warn us of any danger. They look like lizards. They swim up to us, directly to the boats to warn us, you're not allowed here, it's better over there. And if we treat each other badly, there's a risk that the sea spirits will abandon us. To keep our relationship good, we have to make offerings to the ocean. And if we behave well, nothing can happen to us. Luckily for the Badjau Slout, by letting the watchful lizards steer them, they're being guided by the sea and with it the currents, the sun and the plankton that are the origins of life. On the other side of the world, spring has arrived early. In a few weeks, the snow will give way to sand. The ice field is about to disappear. The sea will gradually free itself from the ice. And that's where Slava is heading. With a strange fishing rod in his hand, he's about to take the temperature of the Arctic Ocean. So the temperature is minus 1.8 degrees on the top layer of the water. The ice has lumps of 9 to 10 points. And that's it. Job done. Before, there was the ice field. Last year, it had practically disappeared. Whereas three, four, five years ago, it stretched out two to three kilometers. All throughout the Earth's history, there have been similar changes, warmings followed by coolings. The sea? It's my whole life. I can't live without it. Even if I retire, I wouldn't be able to stay for long away from the sea. You need to spend many years here to feel things. It's hard to put into words. And then, without another word, Slava turns and heads back. On the Tara expedition boat, Gabi Gorski continues his mission. He's getting ready to inspect the plankton who are at the origin of the climate more closely. As small as they are, if the plankton suffer a stress related to the rise in temperature, the consequences could be fatal. And it seems that a last-minute guest could already be threatening this fragile balance. We have two specimens that are typical in these waters, the copods, the little grains of rice, and the amphipods with the big eyes. Unfortunately, there's also plastic floating on the surface, bits of plastic. Given that there has been life on this planet for, we think, nearly 4 billion years, plastic has only existed for 60 years. Yet we've managed to pollute all of the waters from the North to the South Pole, all the oceans, nearly all of the rivers everywhere. 
I sometimes tell students that it's not worth throwing away your plastic bags. Just add some seasoning and eat it directly. In any case, it will find its way back onto your plates. Already on the image, you can see the division and that will go back into the food chain up to the fish. We know that, but that's where I'm optimistic because I think everyone can understand that, including the politicians. And so make the effort to replace unnecessary plastic with biodegradable alternatives. We know that plastic is dangerous for the food chain and for our health. It is dangerous for the climate as well. By blocking the light or polluting the nutrients, plastic disrupts the development of plankton, jeopardizing the links that unite the sky, mankind and the sea. Victor Silva doesn't want to accept this sad analysis. Only just returned from his successful giant squid fishing, he's already left again, this time with his wife and daughter. He takes them to the Isla Foca, where they can find at least 54 species of fish, 32 species of mollusks, mammals, starfish and crustaceans. And plenty of plankton, of course. And then, away from prying eyes, they spot an unusual colony which they have to dock and climb up to observe. Go on, darling. A few sea lions are basking in the sunshine. They're the main competition for the fishermen as they also eat the giant squid. A few years ago, local fishermen killed thousands of them with their oars. But Victor disapproves and he has his reasons. We wanted to come here to show Bianca the diversity of marine wildlife. Here's special, two currents merge. And so there are sea lions, penguins, many different birds. It's the first time that she's seen all these animals. Few fishermen think like that. Most only consider their own interests. It's opportunism. I've been fishing for over 20 years and every day I see that the water temperature rises a little bit. I'd like my voice to be heard because we have to know the damage that man is doing to the sea and marine life. Species are disappearing. For example, there are no more sardines here. And in other parts of the world, like off the coast of Spain, there aren't as many fish as before. We need to wake up to this for our children, our grandchildren. That's my message. We have to wake up. The ocean is the climate's main regulator. Every living being depends on this fragile balance. Tomorrow's world depends on us waking up. <laughs>